Great. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Northeast SARE webinar. Uh, today, we'll be hearing about farmer grants from grant coordinator Candace Huber and farmer Faith Gilbert. My name is Deb Haliba, and I work at Northeast SARE as our communications specialist. And as you may know, Northeast SARE offers a suite of competitive grant programs to advance sustainable agriculture throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. At the center of all of our grant programs are you, farmers, who engage as teachers, learners, teammates, and, research and researchers and project coordinators as in our farmer grant program. So before I turn the mic over to Candice, I want to recognize that our host institution, the University of Vermont, is located on land that has long served um, as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years and is home to Western Abnaki people. In that spirit, we begin by acknowledging that we are guests in this land. Okay, now for some quick housekeeping details. Today's session is scheduled for 60 minutes, so we'll aim to end right at one. We are recording the webinar and we'll post the recording on our website as well as our YouTube channel within the coming week. With thanks to the University of Vermont's American Sign Language uh, Interpreter Services, we are pleased to offer live captioning for this webinar and to follow along. You'll just use the stream text link that, you'll, that you see here um, on the bottom of the slide. And I'll also pop that into um, the chat so you'll have that URL right with you. Um, we have organized several breaks during the presentation today to take your questions. So feel free to type them in at any time. Um, during uh, into the question box, please. Um, I will be helping Candace and Faith manage your questions and will otherwise be in the background if you need me. And with that, I'll turn things over to Candace. Thanks, Deb. And welcome everyone. I'm Candace Huber and I'm the coordinator for the Farmer Grant and Partnership Grant programs for Northeast SARE. And I work out of the University of Vermont in Burlington. The call is open for farmer grants, so I'm going to give you some information about that program and how to apply. Along with the breaks we're going to have for questions, throughout the presentation I will be answering the questions that were submitted with registrations. Also with us today is Faith Gilbert from Letterbox Farm in Hudson, New York, who has received several Northeast SARE grants, and she is going to present a little bit later on and share her experience. Northeast SARE is a USDA funded program through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And it has, we, we serve, the region we serve is the Northeast, which is from Maine all the way down to West Virginia. So the first thing to be eligible is to be within our region. Northeast SARE is a national program and there are four regions throughout the United States. Northeast SARE has several grant programs, one of which is the Farmer Grant Program. Last year, we funded 61 out of 29, or 29 out of 61 proposals, which is 48%. And this is pretty typical of what we usually fund. And we hope to fund that same amount this year. Now, new this year, our maximum amount for these awards is $30,000. Last year and before that, it was only $15,000. So this number, the total amount funded, will probably be about doubled. The increase in the cap is meant to support more complex projects, but I do want to say that smaller, more modest projects are still encouraged and would be just as competitive. Now, Northeast Air has another program for partnership grants, which is similar in that it can be the same topic, but the applicant is not a farmer. It's someone who works with a farmer. So if you are listening and you are not a farmer, but you want to work with one, then the partnership program would be the one for you. And the deadline for that program is next April. April. You can find out more about that program on our website. So these are the basics of the farmer grant program. Farmer grants are for commercial producers who have an innovative idea that they want to test. The projects should seek new knowledge that other farmers can use and address questions that improve the sustainability of farms. 
A technical advisor must be involved. Again, the maximum amount is $30,000 that you can request. You will need to put together a detailed realistic budget and it's important to note that funds are paid on a reimbursement basis. So you or your farm need to be able to float those costs. Projects typically run from one to three years. Applicants may only submit one proposal per year per program in the Northeast. The proposal deadline is November 16th at 5 p.m. And detailed instructions for applying can be found in our call for proposals at northeastsare.org slash farmer grant. I'll be going over all of this in more detail in this next hour. The main goal of the program is to help other farmers in the region. So for your proposal to be competitive, you want to convince the reviewers that your project will benefit sustainable agriculture. Northeast SARE's outcome statement is, agriculture in the Northeast will be diversified and profitable, providing healthful products to customers. Farmers and the people they work with will steward resources to ensure sustainability and resilience and foster conditions where farmers have high quality of life and communities can thrive. So reviewers are ultimately looking at how your project relates to this. What we'll cover today is who can apply and on what topics, what makes a good proposal, and how to submit a proposal, so how to apply. In order to be eligible, you not only need to be in the Northeast region, but you need to qualify as a farmer. You can be a farm owner or an employee of the farm. If you are a farm employee, there is a form you will need to submit that shows that the farm owner approves the project. If you're a farmer in a nonprofit organization, you will need approval from the authorized official. The farm must have the capacity to manage a grant. As I said before, the funds are provided on a reimbursement basis, so the farm needs to be able to pay for expenses up front. Then submit an invoice to SARE for those expenses, and it can take up to 30 days to get payment. This grant program accepts all types and scales of farms. You may be farming on a large scale, a small scale, with organic or conventional practices, urban or rural, full or part-time, but the farm that you own or work on must be a commercial operation with an established farm income of at least $1,000 per year. We do use the USDA definition of a farm, which is any place from which $1,000 or more of agricultural products were produced and sold or normally would have been sold during the census year. Normally would have been sold is an important phrase to note here because the USDA recognizes that some farms experience low sales in a particular year due to bad weather, disease, changes in marketing strategies, or other factors. On our website, we have a document that explains all of this further, and it provides a lot of examples of what qualifies and what does not. To answer some of the questions that came in with registrations, you do not need to show profit as a farm. We do not require evidence or information about a farm's tax status. Aquaponic operations do qualify as farms, as do businesses with value added production, as long as the agricultural production meets that $1,000 minimum. And we were asked, are the grants open to nonprofits? And yes, they are. If that nonprofit has a farm that meets the eligibility requirements and the applicant is the farmer. If you have any questions about whether you're eligible, feel free to contact me directly. As far as topic goes, the only criteria is that it enhances agriculture in the Northeast by addressing opportunities to improve the sustainability of farms based on these themes. Environmental health, profitability, conservation of natural resources, enhanced farm labor, and improved quality of life. We fund a wide range of farms, products, and methods. Here are some topic examples from the last couple of years. Aquaculture, beekeeping or pollination, any sort of crop or livestock production, such as variety trials, cultivation methods, nutrient management, or pest and disease control. Someone asked if calf health is an eligible topic, and it is. Another question was if fiber production, specifically flocks, 
was eligible and yes, fiber is considered an agricultural product. You can work with certain commodities, but your project doesn't have to be commodity specific. Business management, such as developing a model for purchasing for a purchasing cooperative or demonstration or education projects are eligible. The demonstration or education projects are eligible as long as you develop some new educational resource or adapt existing resources to apply them to a new audience of farmers. A project can be developing prototypes or testing something like season extenders. If you want more specific examples, you can go to our projects database on our website and see what we funded. Whatever topic you choose, keep in mind that the project results must benefit the wider agricultural community, not just your farm. It's also important to note that any work that we're funding will be made available to the public through SARE's project database. We do fund product development and product testing. So I just wanna say a little more on that. Product development is building a new tool and seeing if it does what you want it to do. So here the product plans, recipe or design would need to be provided in the final report and would be available to the public. Product testing, however, is when you're looking to see if something that has already been developed works or can be applied in a new way. In this case, you would not need to provide the design of the product in your final report, just the results of your testing. So somebody did ask, would intellectual property or the innovative ideas be at risk of public or industry theft through one's participation? So I just wanna clarify, all proposals are confidential. Once a project is awarded and the contract is in place, all the information and results are reported on and available to the public through our database. So at the proposal stage, it's confidential, but once it's awarded, it is available to the public. We also were asked, what specific topic areas does SARE identify as high need research? Northeast SARE does not predetermine high need topics, but rather leaves it to the applicants to make their case to, re to reviewers that a topic area is highly needed. Providing convincing evidence that farmers are interested in your work helps reviewers understand the extent of the need you're seeking to address. Supporting evidence could be using the census data, a survey, a focus group, pilot study data, or specific examples. As I mentioned before, you are required to have a technical advisor. The role of the advisor is to provide support to you as the grant applicant. Support such as helping you design your project, reviewing your proposal, assisting with outreach, or troubleshooting issues that come up during your project. The technical advisor could be an extension educator or university researcher, private consultant, veterinarian, NRCS or other government staff, nonprofit or for profit ag service providers, or other technical expert, including another farmer. Really, anybody who has experience and knowledge in your topic area. On our website, you can find a guide for technical advisors, which describes their role and could help them understand their responsibility when you go to ask them to be your technical advisor. We also have videos of some farmers and their technical advisors describing how they work together. All right, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Faith Gilbert from Letterbox Farm. We'll tell you a little bit about her experience applying for SARE grants. Faith, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Thanks, Candice. Um, hello, everybody. I'm gonna keep my camera on for a few minutes just so you can see I'm not a robot on the other side of the screen. Um, and then I will share a little information about my farm and the kind of projects that I and my business partner have done through the SARE program. Um, so I am, uh, 10th year farmer. Uh, I am a partner in Letterbox Farm Collective, which is a mixed vegetable and livestock farm in Hudson, New York. You could go to the next slide, Candice. And so we are just finishing our ninth season. Um, we are collectively owned by three individuals, myself and my business partners, Nikki and Laszlo. And we raise vegetables, herbs, flowers, pork, chicken, eggs, and rabbit um, using best practices in animal welfare and organic management. Um, we do multiple farmers markets. We have an on-site farm stand. 
we uh, supply a few small distributors and wholesale relationships, uh, a few restaurants as well. And we have a um, 72 member full diet CSA that runs from April to Christmas. So a lot of diversity on our farm. Um, and uh, to support our business, we also have um, built other um, revenue streams in, including we host a few private events per year and we run a farm stay program. And we also take on grant funded research, education and organizing projects that benefit the farm community. So this is really where Sarah comes in for us. Um, we are you know, organizers by nature um, and Sarah has provided funding for a lot of the things that we wanted to look into or create in our farm community. Could go to the next slide. Um, and there's just a couple of pictures. Uh, you can kind of roll through them, Candice. Um, this is uh, me up top from my business partners and our crew. Um, we have two return crew members as well. I mean, this is our CSA, our Community Supported Agriculture Program, um, where we provide a box share of produce, uh, meat, and eggs to our uh, members on a weekly basis. This is our vegetable fields. Um, you can get a, get a sense of our scale of operations and location. Um, and then we've got some uh, pastured poultry. Uh, those are mobile coops. We've got pastured rabbits as well. Um, and we've got uh, pigs and laying hens um, and a one sheepdog named Moo, um, uh, currently kissing the pigs. Um, so that's kind of our farm. You also see a little overhead shot um, so you can get a sense of what our, again, what our scale of operations is. Um, we've got a lot going on in a little space, but that's sort of how we prefer to farm. Um, and um, so from there, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done for um, Sarah Grants. Um, we've used their grants to, uh, number one, next slide, um, research business and management topics that are interesting to us and produce guides for others to use. Um, so while a lot of SARE projects are sort of scientific in basis about um, measuring methods or, uh, you know, pest management, et cetera, um, we've sort of tended more toward business and management topics because that's just sort of what we're interested in. Um, so the first Sarah Grant I did was called Cooperative Farming, or the project name is Helping Farmers Create Group on Farm Businesses. And that resulted in a 50-page guidebook on um, how to form collaborative uh, businesses in the food system. Um, I followed up with a um, very related topic, sort of a deep dive into sharing farm equipment in the second project, which is called Understanding Equipment Sharing, a Farmer Toolkit. Um, next slide. Now, these are my business partners projects, so I can't speak to them directly, um, but I thought it was helpful just to kind of round out how we've used projects on, on our farm. Um, so we've also used SARE grants to track and document economic viability of different enterprises on our farm and other farms. Um, so uh, my business partner, Nikki Carangelo, uh, had two projects, one related to pastured poultry, um, referencing Joel Salatin's guidebook and um, updating the financials based on case studies from our farm and other farms to see how that um, activity is performing in our region. And relatedly, um, we raise our rabbits on, meat rabbits on pasture, which is pretty unusual. Um, so Nikki did a research project on the profitability of raising rabbit in that way. Next slide. And our most recent project uh, was last, uh, is still current. And uh, the big event was this very spring. Uh, we did a project called Increasing Hudson Valley Farm Viability Through Cooperative Bulk Purchasing <laughs> Big Mouthful that resulted in the Hudson Valley Farm Bulk Order. That's where we are is in the Hudson Valley, New York State. And we really wanted to see um, a group um, supply purchase program that would help our region's farms access farm inputs at a discounted rate. So this is an example of how we've used SARE grants to pilot a service that we wanted to have available in our farm community. Next slide. Um, so one of the things Candace and Deb asked me to speak to is um, how do we generate ideas for SARE grants? It's a great question. Um, we, um, you know, we want to think in advance through the year. We want to sort of be working on, well, what's our SARE grant going to be this year? What new thing can we, you know, provide to the farm community while also, um, you know, being sort of hired on as researchers, which is something we love to do. Um, we are looking at what the, what are the problems we're experiencing? And how can I solve, solve them for myself and others? So it's a great thing to think about while you're annoyed in the field about things that are happening. Um, you know, is there a tool you're missing or information that's not available that you wish were available? That's a great opportunity for a SARE grant. And the other important piece of this is 
you know, what kind of problem solving are you good at? Um, you'll see from our projects, there's a very distinct kind of flavor to our projects. They're a lot about uh, like management, uh, research, organizing, um, like business concepts, as opposed to more, you know, science-based um, research. And that's just because of who we are as people and as farmers, we're really good at, you know, reading, writing, asking questions and producing work. So that's what we've funded. If your skill set is, you know, if that's not at all your skill set, that's perfectly great. There's a whole wealth of SARE grants that will show other different kinds of projects. But I think it's really important to ask yourself, what kind of problem solving are you good at? What can you bring to our, you know, collective knowledge? Next slide. Um, so next up is the writing, the pr proposal writing process. Um, in my experience, it's very helpful to have your concept ready by the time the applications really open up in the fall. So um, this month is a great time to firm up a concept. You want to be kind of workshopping, brainstorming throughout the year. And then by you know, October, you want to say, OK, this is what I think I'm going to apply for this year. And that gives you time to uh, sketch out a very basic concept and look for a technical advisor first. Um, so that's this month uh, with a couple weeks lead time is a good time frame to ask another professional in your network to um, assist with the project. Um, often it takes one to two weeks to get a commitment from, um, from whoever your technical advisor would be. So that's why you want to start that with that piece of the process. In terms of actually writing the proposal, um, I'd say set aside a day to, to draft just like a, you know, a nice big open time frame. The applications aren't incredibly lengthy and this will, but this will greatly vary based on your, you know, writing speed and um, style. So um, for us, that usually means a day to, to get a draft. And then you kind of live with that draft for a little while. You speak with your technical advisor, you might bring some other folks into the project. We always like to take the opportunity while applying to reach out to folks that might be, want to be involved. Um, we think it makes for a really strong application if we say, hey, here are these other three farms that already agreed they'd consult with us or share their numbers with us or whatever um, way you're asking other folks to participate. That's a good way to show that, yes, in fact, other people are interested in this um, knowledge building and we've done enough work to really have a plan in mind for who we're going to talk to and how we're going to get this information. Um, as with all grant proposals, I think a good proposal is uh, includes a detailed actionable work plan. So writing the proposal is not about creating beautiful language. It's about conveying an actionable plan uh, that um, does double duty. It conveys to the grant review board that you really, you know, you really have a clear concept in mind and you're ready to execute it. That's much more fundable than, a, you know, a great idea, but without really clear details on how that's going to go. And the other thing is that that's your opportunity, your first opportunity, uh, but a really important one to make yourself an actual work plan you can follow. So if you do get the grant, you're going to need to start moving pretty much right away to get that done. So it's very helpful to have a sketched out clear work plan in mind. So I encourage you to think of a grant proposal process not as um, kind of a, an act of salesmanship that's about convincing someone of a good idea, it's an opportunity for you to say, this is the work that I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to think that through enough that's convincing for me and for others. Um, uh, just one small piece of advice as well, that you have flexibility in creating your project timeline. Uh, one of the pieces of requirement is that you create a timeline. So you say, you know, I'm going to get the grant in February and March through April, I'm going to take on the first piece. And this is what I'm going to do. And then later in October, I'm going to do this other piece. Um, we're in the Northeast, you know, for us, I'm a vegetable farmer. So uh, our work is highly seasonal. We tend to sketch out projects and build projects in a way that allows us to do the bulk of the work in the off season, or at least the shoulder season. Um, if you're doing something that's a little more science and research based, you might need to, um, uh, you might need to do that a little bit differently, um, but you know, just a, a note that this timeline should line up with your farming duties. Um, I'm getting a little note that you're hearing some background noise, so I'm just going to switch locations and turn off the video. Um, <clears throat> and the last piece is that 
uh, you would send your proposal for feedback to your technical advisor and any other trusted, trusted advisors you may have. So once you've got that sketched concept, you're living with it over the month and strengthening it. Um, so you'd send that out for review. And then I'd suggest you clear your calendar the day before proposals are due so that you can do a last round of edits and submit long before that midnight deadline. Um, so those are my pieces of advice on writing proposals. Next slide, please. Um, and lastly, executing the grant. Um, the main things I wanted to offer here is just some, some lived experience in organizing yourself. Um, one of the main things you're gonna need to do is keep track of the finances of your project. If you're not familiar with grant reimbursals, um, it's a little bit of a higher level of you know, keeping your receipts and communicating, uh, keeping clear records than you might, than some of us might be doing for our own purposes or for our farms. Um, so the number one thing you might need to do is to create a process in advance for how to uh, keep track of grant related receipts. If you lost that receipt because you tend to crumple them in your wallet, um, then you're not going to be able to be reimbursed for that item. So um, I'd say make a plan in advance for how to keep track of grant related receipts, such as a special envelope in the uh, glove compartment of your pickup truck or, um, you know, a calendar reminder to take all the receipts out of your wallet and file them correctly at a particular time, whatever works best for you. Um, and then in terms of the rest of the scope of the project, I wanted to just share uh, an example of how we've organized ourselves. Um, and I will share my screen in order to do that. So um, I'm a big fan of Google Docs and Sheets. And I'm also a big fan of um, fewer documents, more tabs. So including everything kind of in one living document, uh, including your timeline, um, maybe some active note taking um, and your project budget. Um, so uh, that way, you know, you have the same the same document you're pulling up again and again. It's easy to remember that the title it comes up easily in your search bar, and it's like you know you can kind of uh, toggle between different aspects of your project management at the same time. So just wanted to share for whatever um, to whatever degree this is helpful. This is our my organizer's workbook um, that I create for every project. This one is for the bulk order program we did in the spring. And in one tab, I have uh, my timeline that's pulled from my grant application and then continually updated and, um, and tracked you know, as you go. So you've got that timeline. And then whenever you find yourself thinking, okay, what's the next step? You can go ahead and cruise through and see uh, what else is left. And then depending on your project, you might have all different kinds of information you're organizing. Um, this one, I had to track vendors, vendor information, and then different parts of the process. So just kind of keeping it all in one place um, is really helpful rather than having things all over the place. Um, and then lastly, um, we have some you know, docs and links, whatever is helpful to you. Uh, time tracking, which I find extremely helpful, one for uh, being reimbursed from SARE for our time. And also um, if there's anything about time viability or, um, you know, the expense of time or if the project is replicable, super helpful to have a record of how time was spent uh, so that you can, um, you know, see what it might take to replicate that project. And then lastly, um, you want to have your budget included from your, um, your SARE project. And um, I also include an expense log to track those expenses so I don't have to run them up later. And anytime I invoice SARE, I would also just make a tab here so that I can track it easily, reference, see what have I reimbursed so far versus what do I still need to reimburse um, if I need to make any budget update, updates, et cetera. Um, so that's what I have to share today. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and hand it back over to Candice. And I'm if there's time, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Great, thank you, Faith. That was tremendous. Um, the work you're doing is, is really very exciting and I appreciate you sharing your experience and insight. Um, you summed up everything beautifully. And uh, for everybody, if there's nothing else you take away from this webinar, what Faith said will take you a long way. Uh, that was really great.
So we're going to pause here and answer any questions you have so far for me or for Faith. Um, and before we bring in questions from the chat, I wanted to sort of address a couple of questions that came in from registration. Um, one of them was, um, is, are the funds taxable, the grant funds? And yes, they are. You will be receiving a 1099 from UVM at the end of the year on that. Um, how is equity considered in the review process of applications? Well, if part of a proposal's goal is to address equity in the food system, this should be included in the problem and solution section of the proposal, where the problem, issue, or opportunity and why it matters are described. And so then re reviewers will feel, fully be able to consider that equity piece. Um, reviewers evaluate the extent to which all proposed projects contribute to Northeast Sarah's outcome statement, as I mentioned earlier. Do we fund grants for overseas agricultural business operations? No, the proposed project must lead to new information that enhances Northeast agriculture, Northeast US agriculture, and be applied in the Northeast. Can I collaborate with a farmer to get this grant? Yes, we encourage collaboration. We do, however, need one farmer to be the project leader, and that person will manage the project, be our point of contact, and handle the finances. Is there help applying? You can call me anytime if you have questions about the application process. But if you need help developing your proposal, you can hopefully get help from your technical advisor or contact another peer or professional who has grant writing experience. So hopefully that answers those. Um, Debs, do we have any other questions that came in? Or yeah, we have quite a few questions that have come into the queue. And for folks that are um, wanting to ask questions, you'll just type it into the question box and I will read those out loud and we'll try to get to um, as many as we have time for. So I'm just jump right in. Candace, do projects related to grain production like wheat qualify for these grants? Yes, agricultural production, yep. Um, how about, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. okay. How might you justify a research project on a practice that is widespread in Europe, but new to the United States, and hence there might not be data available showing farmer interest in that practice? Either of you wanna- Well, if there, that. yep, there may not be, um, interest in the practice, but what problem is that practice addressing? How will that practice benefit? Will, will it um, increase time saved harvesting something in particular? And then you can address how farmers um, are interested in learning how to harvest that particular something. So think more about the problem rather than the practice there for that, I would say. Um, I would add to that too and just say that um, we've largely used anecdotal information to show that a problem is important to other farmers in our area. Um, and that could, um, for example, for the bulk order program, there is no data saying X number of farmers want this to happen. Uh, we can collect that after the grant and we receive the grant. But um, before that, there's usually not much to reference, but you can say, for example, you know, this has happened, you know, we've had many informal attempts to solve this problem that weren't effective. And we can also say something a little more broad, like the cost of production is exceptionally high in our area. Therefore, any strategy that works on that problem is valuable. So you can kind of uh, pull from documented problems that are a little larger, like um, economic viability or production issues or climate, climate adaptation issues or whatever you're working on, um, as opposed to specifically documented interest in your particular topic. Wonderful. Um, so I have some other questions about um, eligibility types of uh, enterprises. Um, are Christmas tree production considered agriculture for these grants? Yes, they are. Excellent. Um, how about are variety trials valid for grants? Yes, they are. Um, can a farm apply for more than one grant if related to, diff to different enterprises? No. Um, well, so <clears throat> we the grants are one per person per program per year. So a farmer can only submit one proposal this year. Um, you could. Next year, 
submit another proposal for another grant that maybe builds on this one or is a different enterprise. Um, if you're a nonprofit organization and you've got several farm employees, different farm employees within the same organization can apply, but not the same app. They can't be the same specific applicant who will be the project manager. If you have multiple ideas, choose the best one and go with that one. Um, how about climate change adapt uh, adaptation strategies? Yes, yep, we've had a lot of um, projects that deal with that topic. Okay, um, I, I think we're um, running out of time for this question and answer, but I just wanted to note that, um, Faith, you're getting a lot of requests for sharing your spreadsheet, <clears throat> um, which we didn't discuss before <laughs> the webinar, so that might be something that we can talk about. Um, and um, I can answer that briefly. Thanks for your interest. Um, part of our app, our grant process in this round is to create uh, replicable materials. So I'm not able to share our particular spreadsheet at this time, but we'll be sharing um, te related templates um, once we're able to create those documents. So if you're interested in that spreadsheet, you can check back in on our project page um, in about six months and you should see it there. Awesome, thank you so much. And then um, one last question before we move um, on and Faith, you might, help with this one um how do you find an advisor a technical advisor um yeah i can jump in on that we've run the gamut we sometimes have used a really general technical advisor um, which is our uh, local cooperative extension agent um our you know beginning farmer specialist person is available to all um so um it really can be someone as simple as that it's just a you know a any professional service provider in your network. Um, and you can always look to extension. That said, extension may not have the, you know, a breadth of knowledge on your particular topic. Um, so, you know, a step better than that would be to seek out support from someone even a little outside the region that has experience with a similar topic. Um, so we, this time around, um, sought a technical advisor from another non a nonprofit that had a bulk order program going. Um, so it doesn't have to be a perfect one-to-one -one match, but it would be really helpful to speak to someone else who had done a similar project or was running a program um, similar to what you wanted to do. Um, so I'd say, yeah, those are two options. Excellent. Um, and one last question. Um, this one's for you, Candace, and I'm not sure if we have the numbers in front of us, but um, someone is asking about the number of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color applicants and um, BIPOC um, grantees. Um, and I know we've been collecting that information, but I'm not sure if we have that in front of us right now. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have that information. Okay. We'll be, we, we'll be sure to follow up with you with those numbers for sure. Um, and with that, I think we should uh, move on because we're, we're um, losing, losing some time. All right, great. Thank you um, everyone for the great questions. Um, there we go. So you have an idea um, and you've identified your technical advisor. So the next step in order to apply is to design your project. This is something your technical advisor can help you with. Um, it also helps to read the call for proposals. So you have the overview of all the information you'll need to provide. Um, and Faith gave so much great information about this aspect of, of, of figuring, getting to the grant. Um, but you wanna, be, you wanna read the call proposals, then you wanna be clear about what the problem or issue is that you wanna address and you want to identify your objectives. Then think about the best way to achieve those objectives and answer your questions. So an experimental design might include field trials, on-farm demonstrations, case studies, or other techniques. Someone um, had asked about the side-by-side -side trials of different treatments, and yes, that would certainly qualify as a project. You'll, then you'll also want to identify your budget. Make sure you consider all the costs involved. So for help developing a research project, you could check out the SARE publication on our website called How to Conduct Research on Your Farm. 
So you will need to put together a detailed budget and justification of the expenses for your project. On our website is a template for this where you'll identify each expense, why you need it, and the cost in terms of unit quantity and price. Faith had pulled up her budget spreadsheet and that was the template that you'll, you'll be using from our website. It's important to look at actual prices and provide those because we will wanna see what you're basing your amounts on. This is all explained in the detail in the call for proposals. And there's also an example there of a budget. So we want real numbers. If at the time of the expense, the amounts are a little different, that's fine. But for purposes of the budget, it needs to be realistic at the time of the proposal. All of the expenses must happen during the contract period. We can't cover anything that was paid before or after. Um, contracts will start March 1st and your end date will be, will be set based on the time you need to do your project. Let's go over what Sarah does and does not fund. The type of expenses that are covered are personnel time, that could be your time that is extra that the project is requiring, or time of one of your employees, materials and supplies, like flagging, seed, collection vials, rope, that sort of thing, travel, Sometimes you have to travel, maybe as part of the study or for outreach to present your results. Printing and publications. You might wanna print a flyer for a field day or a fact sheet, or maybe you wanna print guides with your study results. Other direct costs include things like equipment rental, soil tests, consultant fees, but everything you request funding for must be specific to your SARE project. Some things we don't cover are business or farm startup costs. Now there may be other programs for that. So you could check with your local extension office or other farmer organizations if you need startup money. We can't pay, pay for you to build a structure like a barn or do a major renovation. We can't cover the purchase of equipment unless it's specialized and will only be used for the project. And likewise, we won't cover labor or operating expenses for your normal farm operation. Now, if you're putting in extra time to do the study, you can request that time under personnel. For example, time spent recording data on collected eggs for the study is eligible, but time spent collecting the eggs that you would normally be collecting anyway is not eligible. Cell phones and cell charges are not allowed. We can't cover motorized vehicles. Food is not allowed unless it's necessary for the continuity of a meeting and we can't pay for any swag or gifts. So a few more tips for creating your budget. People often ask how much they should charge for labor. We don't have a specific amount, but we do want you to be compensated for your time on the project, and we encourage you to request a realistic and fair wage. Project collaborators can certainly be paid, but be sure to fully explain what they will be doing. And we already mentioned that startup costs and general operating expenses are not allowed. So just going back to equipment for a minute, SARE will only fund equipment that is necessary for the project and not and something that you would not normally use for your current operation. If the equipment will have no use after the project, then the expenses would be eligible at 100%. If it would have use on the farm or other farms after the project, you would only be allowed to request a prorated amount based on its usable life. So here we have an example. The farm needed a microscope for their project and they didn't have one. SARE prefers that equipment be rented, but sometimes that's just not feasible. So in that case, you'll need to purchase the item and can request reimbursement at the prorated amount. Here, the microscope is considered to have a useful life of 10 years. It costs $1,600. Since the project is a two-year project, Sarah would pay 20% of the cost or $320. Now, if they had found a rental option for the microscope, it would go under rental of equipment. In this particular example, they needed more land to do their project. So they've included that in their budget as a rental charge. If you have any questions about how to put equipment into your budget, please contact me. More tips um, for the budget. Reviewers will look at the higher funding requests to be related to more complex projects where there might be collaboration with other farmers who are you're paying their, 
for their time, more outreach in the form of events or media publications, or more intensive research where you replicate it over multiple sites or years and then analyze the statistics. But again, we still want to encourage simpler projects with smaller budgets. These can be just as competitive as the bigger projects. Someone asked, how, how small of a project is too small? Well, really no project is too small. Just be sure to make the case as to why the work is important. Another question was about uh, accountability and reporting. All expenses must have proof of payment and be within the budget. Like Faith was saying, keep track of your receipts. Um, there's no final financial report required, but there are technical reports required. Um, so if you're awarded a grant, you'll need to provide annual progress reports on the project work and a final report with the results. Now the proposal itself is a series of questions. We highly recommend that you prepare your answers to the questions before entering them into the online system. In the call for proposals, there's a link to a Word doc format of these questions. It's called the proposal prep worksheet. You can use this to prepare your answers, paying attention to the fact that there are word limits for each question. And this is what you'll see in the worksheet. First, the proposal summary. This is a standalone summary of the project, describing the issue, objectives, key components of your plan of work, and outreach strategy. Since the summary is the first thing reviewers will see, we recommend taking some time to make it clear and compelling. In fact, you may want to write this after you've written the rest of your proposal when you're clear about all the other pieces. Next, describe your experience, your farm, and what resources you have. Reviewers will want to know that you're able to carry out the project. Then describe the problem, the issue, or the opportunity that you're addressing. Why is it important? What can you do to make it better? As said before, providing convincing evidence, such as data, surveys, focus groups, industry data, specific examples, or the anecdotal information that Faith was talking about, will help convince reviewers that farmers are interested in this work and that it's needed. Discuss previous work. Look back at what's already been tried and how you're built how your project builds on existing efforts. You'll want to cite studies and articles to demonstrate your knowledge of current research. Provide a list of citations that you reference under that previous work, as well as anywhere else in your proposal. Clearly state your objectives, preferably in a numbered list. Be specific in stating the questions you're asking. Materials and methods. Reviewers want to know that your methods will get you to the results that are meaningful and will answer your questions. So as Faith was saying, this is, could be like a guide to your procedures. For instance, if you'll be collecting samples, be specific about how many samples, how you'll handle the samples, when you'll collect them, the tools you'll use to perform the tests. Just be very specific. This is also where you can upload any diagrams, sample questionnaires, or anything that can help reviewers understand what you're going to do and how. You'll then describe your outreach plan. We want you to explain what you're going to do to tell others, other farmers about your project results. This could be demonstrations, twilight meetings, presentations, a guide, video, webinar. There are many options and it does not have to be an in-person event. We have a great resource on our website called Conducting Online Outreach and that could give you a bunch of ideas. And then the timeline. Lay out each activity for your methods and your outreach, when, who will do them and how long it will take. There are also attachments that you should gather ahead of time because they need to be submitted with your proposal by the deadline. All applicants are required to submit a letter of commitment from their technical advisor and the budget justification and narrative spreadsheet. And then there are some other cases. If you're not the farm owner, but an employee, you need to submit the grant commitment form that's signed by either the farm owner or the authorized official from the organization. If you're collaborating with other farmers or professionals, then you need to obtain and submit a letter of commitment from them. And if there's something that would be relevant to your research, such as plot layout, survey tool, et cetera, you should submit those as well. There are two final questions that don't apply to everyone regarding human subjects and livestock. If you aren't working with either of these, you can answer no to each one and move on. USDA NEPA requires that projects are done in accordance with protections for people and vertebrate animals. So if you're working with either of these three groups, you need to answer the relevant questions. This is described more in the call for proposals. And if you have any questions about whether it applies to you, please contact me.
tips for submitting. Make sure that you, your project is a good match for SARE, that you're eligible and that your project will benefit farmers in the Northeast US. Start early. Previous applicants have reported that developing and submitting, submitting a proposal can take up to 40 hours. For some, maybe it only takes 10 or 20. Also, be sure to discuss your project with your technical advisor well in advance. Prepare your application offline and ask others to review it. Write with the reviewers in mind. They have broad agricultural expertise, but may not be deeply familiar with your specific topic area. So make it clear and easy for reviewers to understand what you're going to do and why. Develop your budget. Think through your project expenses. Don't pull numbers out of a hat, but get real pricing. And remember the attachments. Don't wait till the last minute to get letters or signatures. The deadline for the farmer grants is 5 p.m. for the proposals is 5 p.m. on November 16th. Be sure to leave yourself extra time in case you have some glitches or technical difficulties. Proposals must be complete with attachments and will not be accepted after 5 p.m. The proposals then move forward through the review process and results are announced at the end of February. For awarded projects, we'll be issuing contracts in March. If your proposal is not accepted for a grant, we will send you comments from reviewers by April so that you can understand how you could improve your proposal if you would like to resubmit next year. So um, we can take a quick break for a few more questions. Um, and um, then I'll go over how what it looks like online to submit your proposal. Deb, do we have some questions for now? We yeah, we sure do. <laughs> um, Let's see. So, um, does SARE need to approve your technical advisor? Is there a formal agreement written that the advisor and applicant need to sub submit or sign? No, um, the technical advisor will submit a letter, um, a signed letter that will um, that will state their commitment to the project, and that's all we require. Great. Um, how frequently can you submit receipts? Uh, once a month is what the um, our financial manager requests. But if you if you need if you have any other needs, you can talk to her and make arrangements, and she'll be happy to work with you. Great. Um, let's see. We are looking at new product development to promote our area veteran farmers. What costs can be associated with new product labeling? Um, well, yes, um, marketing um, can be, but remember you have to, their project has to benefit other farmers as well. So if you are um, setting up a program or a product for a, a specific use or group, um, you will wanna make sure that you um, have an angle to it where you, it can be a model for other people to use. Great, um, are utilities considered billable? Utilities are considered billable, um, utilities that are, are necessary specifically for the work on the project, if you can parse those out. Okay, um, let's see. If a farmer is doing something successfully in Vermont, can we learn about it and create it here in New York and still get grant money? Yes, uh, so that would be applying it to a new audience um, and you would wanna measure how that works and and see what might need to, what worked and what did, didn't by doing that. Can you talk a bit about funds eligibility for durable goods equipment in terms of product development projects? How do you build and test things without buying components? Uh, well, we do, we would fund the components. There's a, um, a section called fabrication of equipment and the budget, and you would list out everything you would need there to be able to build the, the whatever it is, the product. Um, uh, again, though, in that case, um, your designs would be available to the public once um, you have them figured out, they would be included in your final report. Great. Um, does the grant require or prefer the involvement of a local, the local farming community or can the grant be for an on-farm project that will boost our profitability? Or productivity. Again, it can be for an on-farm project, but it does need to benefit others 
um, other farmers as well. So if you're going to be doing something specific to your farm, it has to have, um, it has to in some way be replicable, be a model for other farms, or be in some way useful to other farms, the results of your project. Great. And there's a couple of uh, questions about uh, compensation for TA, uh, for technical advisors. Can you compensate your technical advisor? Yes, you can write them into the budget as a consultant and compensate them. Um, okay, where is the Word doc template? Um, that's built in. You should take a look at the call for proposals, which I can uh, post a link to. Yeah, that's accessible um, at, from the call for proposals. It's not just on the website. Yeah. Can your technical advisor be from within a nonprofit farm organization? Yes. Um, let's see. I think, uh, can the labor of harvesting be included if the amount being grown was for say, was for say, was significantly more due to different conditions? Uh, maybe the, the key question is, can the, like, the labor of harvesting be included in your project? Yeah, if it's, yeah, if it's for harvesting um, something that is um, key to your project. Great. I think we'll... Oh, okay. One more. Um, can a farmer in a nonprofit use a... TA from that same nonprofit? You can, but they um, cannot be the same person who is running the project. The farmer needs to be the person who is managing the project. Um, and the technical advisor can be um, within the same organization, but it's good to, it's, um, but they can't be managing the project or doing the bulk of the work. Great. I think with that, Candice, we should just get going because we have about three more minutes. And um, I just want to let folks know if we don't get time for your questions, um, we will follow up and post all of your questions with answers um, on, um, on our website. So um, please, if you don't get your question answered, don't feel like we're not going to answer them. Thanks, Deb. Um, and so this last section, I was going to go briefly through how to submit your proposal online. Uh, since we only have three minutes left, it's gonna be very brief, um, but I we will be posting this on the website so you can come back to this section and look. And I think that's when, when you're ready to apply, that's where it's gonna be most helpful anyway. You can look at these screenshots and see what, what it's gonna look like and, and where you need to be. Um, so you've gone through all the preparation and you're ready to apply on, put your proposal in online. Um, if you've applied before, you'll already have an account. So this is the same system where you submit reports. So you use your same login. If not, you click here to create an account where you'll be asked to set up your profile with the contact info. You'll also be asked for demographic information. Um, it's not tied to your project, but while these fields are required, you can select prefer not to answer if you wanna opt out of the questions. Once you complete your profile, you'll see an applicant registration screen and you'll receive an email with your login information and how to proceed. When you create a new password, you'll see this screen. Um, if you are an already a, have an account, but you forgot your password, you follow that link and you'll get to the same screen. Then you'll get to, uh, once you're logged in, you'll land on your project's homepage. And you'll need to just make some choices here, select Northeast and then the 2022 Northeast Farmer Grant, begin a new proposal. Here, um, you'll, you'll now be into the proposal itself. You can go back to the call for proposals by clicking here. You'll need to add a project title by clicking edit title, and you'll need to add a project, a short project description. You should not need to change the project leader, um, but if for some reason you do, um, let me know and we can discuss that note if you have any accessibility issues this proposal submission please contact me so we can um, figure it out we want everybody to have an opportunity to apply you'll then see the list of uh, the question sections here um, you'll go through um, in order to answer each one you'll need to click edit answer Here's it's for the project start date. You click edit answer, you enter the date, then you click save. You'll see answer save. 
It's really important to save your answer so it'll be there when you go back. Um, you can always view a draft of your proposal by clicking up here at the top. Um, in order for um, you to move forward and be able to submit your proposal, all of these sections have to have a green check next to them, which means they're complete. If there's a red asterisk, that means there's some information missing there. You'll click submit proposal when you're ready to submit. It's a two-step process. Click submit proposal here, then you'll come to this screen where they're asking you if you're sure you want to submit, and you click submit proposal again. You'll get confirmation email. Um, you will also have an opportunity to unsubmit your proposal before the deadline. So if you decide, remember, oh, I meant to do this or that. Again, through managing your grant proposals, click unsubmit proposal, make your edits, and then submit it again. But be sure to resubmit before the deadline in order to have your proposal reviewed. Every time you submit or unsubmit, you'll get an email. So make sure that last email is for an actual submission. We do have on our website all of our um, resources, the proposal instructions that give you the UR link to the online system and also that Word doc to use um, for preparing your answers. Um, you'll have the budget narrative and justification template and the grant commitment form, and then all the other resources that we've talked about today on our website at northeastseric.org slash farmer grant. So I apologize for that last section being so brief, but I do want to honor our time. And um, if you have any further questions, um, if they're not in the chat, you can always contact me. As Deb said, we'll get those questions answered and post them on our website and get that information to you all. Um, and otherwise, I really want to thank Faith Gilbert for joining us today. She was fabulous and gave so much valuable information. And um, Thank you all for joining us. And I don't know if we have one minute left where we can do any more questions or not. I'll go back to Deb. We, yeah, uh, unfortunately we are at time. So I wanna be, um, or after time. So I wanna be cognizant of, of people's busy schedules, but um, we will be answering those questions and following up with you all on um, information that we provided or that you requested. Um, so thank you, uh, Faith, and thank you, Candice, um, and thank you all for joining us today. And um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions um, and on your journey. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.